I went down there. It was the first Sunday. It started out. I went down there about seven o'clock at night, and I got turned away by highway patrol. So it was just like seven of them. They shined a spotlight in my truck and everything. Asked for identification, so I gave that to them. They told me, you know, not to come back around because it's very important business. So I said, okay. And then I went on around through L and tried to get a little closer, but they had they had one in the middle of the road there. So I turned around. I just came back to Bell, where I live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first day we got here, but um, I think. You know, I don't think the people are really going to give up. I think they're there to stay because they've been there since the 1950s. And uh -huh. the old people, I mean, the young people might give up, but the old people, it's like they're, it's like they're home. I mean, that's all they know in their whole life. Uh-huh. Pretty well to stay there. My dad, he used to go out there, go fishing, and he talked to the people and everything. He ate with them. He said they were the nice people. They didn't, you know, they didn't mess with anybody or nothing. They stayed to themselves. Uh-huh. They're real peaceful people. I mean, I don't know why this happened. Yeah. But I think if they would have had the sheriff come out there, you know, and talk to them, instead of all the ATF people coming out there, I mean, it's scary. Mm -hmm. All the ATF people coming out there with guns and storms in place. So they opened up on them. You know? Uh-huh. Yeah. It sounds like self-defense to me. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh-huh. I mean, they kind of climbed up on that roof and knocked that window out and started trying to shoot in there. And yeah. That's when the four ATF officers got killed. But, uh -huh. I mean, it's, I mean, if it happened to me, you know, you know, all the ATF people coming out of horse trailers, you know, coming after me, I mean, I do the same thing. Yeah. You know, there's a common thread in all of this, from Oklahoma City to the World Trade Center bombing to, of course, Waco. They always destroy the evidence and don't let locals in to document anything. What do they have to hide? If this was some murderous cult, as the TV shows told us, then what did they have to hide? Why do they always destroy the remains? This building was burnt to the ground, but they still bulldozed the entire foundation and pushed it up in a heap, in a monument to the wreckage of the police state. Welcome to the New World Order. We're standing at the entrance to the underground bus, the bunker that they had built because they believed in times of tribulation they would need something like this. Well, they ran over with the tanks and crushed the entrance so they couldn't get in to their underground bunker. And as a result, the men, women, and children died. Also, one of the tanks drove inside the structure, and this is even admitted to by the FBI, and there was a inside area area where they stored food and things that was concrete and they thought that was the safest area because most of the structure was wood right over there. They drove directly in and pumped CS gas, a banned form of chemical weapon, point blank range into children's faces. They don't make gas masks that fit two and three and four year old children, my friends. This is incredible. No matter what propaganda you want to believe, those babies did not deserve to be murdered by the black ski mask thugs. You didn't come out in the trial. You're some kind of provocateur. In fact, you're one of those FBI agents, aren't you? Hey, we're in the middle of one of our interviews right now. I don't personally, I don't give a damn. Well, I don't give a damn about you either. So oh, yeah, you're not going to do anything well, to me. These people are murderers. Okay. These people are murderers. I'm sick and tired of hearing your lies when yeah. you machine gunned a bunch of men, women, and children. You got a big problem, buddy. You sit over here. I'm not afraid of you guys. I'm a law-abiding citizen, and I'm sick of it. You sit over here, and you talk about how the children huddle in the corner and how the ammunition that they had is what killed them, all the rest of your garbage. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You don't stand up for the Constitution. You stand for zip, not a zero. You, you have no calm of plumb. It's false, my friend. And let me tell you, a lot of people are writing down your names. You can follow people around. You can harass people. You can back up your bankster buddies. But a revolution of peaceful information is coming. And when it comes time, you people are going to be brought to punishment. You understand? Just like Nuremberg. Just taking orders doesn't cut it, my friend. You understand me? 
I think I've assessed you. Yeah, oh, you've assessed me. You Listen, you can sit there and say some kind of little joke. All your textbook garbage, my friend. I got people like General Parton, ex-head of Air Force Weapons Development. We know the federal government destroyed Oklahoma. It's proven. We know what you guys are engaged in, just like Hitler burnt the Reichstag. We know you brought Nazis over here through the rat line to set up our CIA after the OSS. So you can't sit here. You can assess me all day. I want you to assess me. I've assessed you. A smiley face slime ball that sits here in soft pedals and tries to placate the media. Waco Rules of Engagement shows your agents machine gunning men, women, and children as, as they tried to exit. One of the inventors of flare technology worth hundreds of millions of dollars is on that documentary. He is of the establishment. Well, you Didn't you hear what I said? No. Yeah, but we don't need this type of placating. Somebody coming and saying, oh, I'm so sorry that we did this. We don't need that. We need indictments. Then you need to go and you need to call for indictments of Janet Reno. Okay. Are you calling for an indictment of Janet Reno? Herman no. Goering and Drag. Are you, oh, Are you so you're not calling yeah. for okay, Herman Goering and Drag. What about people around the tanks through this place? Yeah. Well, here you have it, right here. We're told that the bunker was here where the children cowered, where they c drove directly in with the tank and pumped in the CS gas from point blank range, and then they pushed all the rubble over there. So the bunker was somewhere over in this area. This is just uh, more of Big Brother, and we just went over there to one of the FBI negotiators who's now over here soft peddling things. I not, just, and, not calling for indictments. and he's not calling for indictments of Reno, Herman Goering, and Drag. You know, all these slaves are going to get what they ask for. The IRS bending people over all day and all night. It's a real pleasure to stand up to Big Brother and all his slimy cronies. Let's get out of here. Here with Bonnie Haldeman, David Koresh's mother. You know, I've seen you here today and talked to you some. You seem like a really gentle, nice woman. And that makes me think even more so that all the stories we heard in the controlled media were lies about your son. They were lies. They were lies. Mm -hmm. He was a kind, gentle person who loved people, and his main goal in life was to help, you know, save people's souls. And uh, he didn't like anybody to be unkind to anybody else. And he also told the BATF to come on over two weeks before. He did. He told them several times to come out. They were in the gun shop one day and uh, found out that they were there asking about him, and he said, tell them to come on over. The sheriff knew him. Sheriff Harwell knew him. And the had, sheriff of this county said that he was a good guy and wasn't bothering anybody and that this yeah. is a good community out here. He had come out here many times, uh, you know, just in and talked to David. And Sheriff Harwell told me last year, he, he said, I'm sure I'm sorry, Bonnie, what happened. Is there anything I can do for you? Well, well there, there you have it. Happens, you know. Attorney General, sheriff here in Waco, the uh, sheriff here in Waco. It just goes on and on. FBI crime lab chiefs. What more do you need? The documentation is there. What would you say to the public in, in Austin, Texas, if there's just a few statements that you want to make to them about how they can avert this type of tragedy happening in the future? How can they avert it? <laughs> well, we need to stand up for what we know is right and to, to demand that um, investigations be done on what happened here and see if it doesn't happen again. Indictments. Indictments. And, you know, we've got all of our family in prison that shouldn't be there. The jury of their peers found them innocent and they're spending hundreds you know, of years in prison. And, and that's, very, that's very strange. Right here, you have the structure. And the BATF came up, knocked on the door, and Koresh raised his hand and said, stop, let's talk about this. We have women and children. They opened fire, this is on the FBI's own tape, into the front of the structure. This is even the edited tape. And the door that's disappeared, lawyers and people that went inside said that since the bullets were going in, from the outside. You can tell this for novices out there. When a bullet hits a metal door, it makes a small hole going in and a large hole going out. So this, again, government-sponsored terrorism in your country. We'd already had breakfast, and I was back in my room, and all of a sudden I hear a lot of people out here in the, in the cafeteria, and I thought, what's going on? Seems to be a lot of people out there, and we've already eaten, so what, what's the deal? So I go in there to find out what's going on, and somebody says, hey, we just got word that somebody's coming. It's going to be some kind of a, a raid or, or whatever. And about that time, David walked in from this side. Uh, he'd come down the hall and come in the cafeteria from the, this other side and basically confirmed it. He says, uh, we just heard that, you know, there's a whole bunch of some kind of agents coming. And uh, he says, I want everybody to stay cool, go back to your rooms, just be calm. He said, I'll go down the front door and, and talk to them, see what they want. And, and, you know, try to talk to them. So I went back to my room, 
I heard him walk down the hall, heard him open the front door, and next thing he's yelling, hey, wait a minute, there's women and children here, you know, let's talk about this, and all hell breaks loose. I mean, there's shots coming in the front door like crazy. And uh, my initial reaction was run down the hall because I figured there's going to be blood and guts everywhere, you know, massacre. And I don't even, I get about, oh, about level with where we are, about halfway down the hall, and Perry Jones is crawling up the hall screaming that he's been shot. He'd gone to the front door with David, and he's telling me David's been shot. So I'm trying to comfort him. He's laying on the floor and screaming, and uh, I said, hang in there, Perry, because I'm thinking there's all these other people dead inside the front door or whatever. So I go running down there, and lo and behold, there's no one up inside, no one in the foyer area at all. So I run back to Perry, and I'm trying to help him. And, uh, so on the tape, as we see the BATF from the outside firing in incessantly, you guys are just going around trying to look for people that have been shot. Well, that's, see, you mean I, you guys aren't I, lining the windows shooting no, like the television no, no, shows no. us? I mean, like the made-for-TV movies? The movies aren't real? There have been a lot more than four dead and 20 wounded if everybody had been there with a gun and automatic weapon shooting at them. You know, but uh, yeah. no, that's not the case. In fact, I'd say most people were taken by surprise. Even though, even though you initially told well, somebody's coming, you don't realize that it's going to be a bloody mess, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you maybe have a little trepidation, well, you know, are, we, are they going to be uh, haul us all outside, are we all going to jail, uh, what, what's the procedure, you know, we, we didn't know what was going to happen, but David more or less said, well, you know, everybody stay calm, I'll go down and talk to him, so you figure, oh, he'll handle it, you know, and uh, so uh, next thing we know, all this shooting at the front door, um, people upstairs, of course, are hearing the shooting from the helicopters. The helicopters came in from that direction. And they were coming, and as they came in, David's room was here, extend like this is the building. His room's extended out on the south side, and that's what they were pointing at. They were pointing at his room, and <clears throat> and they came in shooting in a V formation. And I'll tell you, I tried to keep it up. The infrared with the explosion and the people, the flashes that we have on infrared absolutely prove beyond a shadow of the doubt that people were killed. You know, a lot of averages would state that if there's nine survivors, and I'm one of the nine, the people that survived came out of the side and the front of the building, the majority of the people were at the back of the building, in the cafeteria area. A lot of averages would state that, you know, if nine people survive from a fire, that that people are going to come out of the back where the majority of the people are. And the fact that no one survived that came out of the back always escaped me. I could never understand why. I had a theory, but I could never prove it. This